is Brody Miller. I'm a partner at Ricky Noonan, a law firm in St. Cloud, Minnesota. We're happy to be sponsoring today's CMB, CMBA meeting, albeit under remote circumstances. And obviously, you know, the mute this morning, um, it wouldn't happen in person. I do miss attending the CMME meetings, not just because of the lost uh, catered breakfasts, breakfast, but also the missed opportunities to tour the manufacturing facilities in person. Um, I've always enjoyed learning how things are made and put together and about the continuous improvements and innovation and efficiencies occurring within the manufacturing industry. Uh, this interest uh, definitely continues with my boys. I thought I'd share what my garage floor normally looks like. My boys regularly take apart and put things back together just to see how they work. Um, it's always filled with the old TVs, weed backers, dismantled by my, my kids, which is uh, true testimony to their curiosity and innovation and hopefully it leads to something in engineering or manufacturing as well. Uh, I thought I too I'd share their latest creation, this uh, go-kart, and I thought it was interesting that they used, uh, see the innovative string there with the rock duct tape to the end of it on each set of the wheels in the front to steer. I thought that was kind of an ingenious idea for them. Um, I've enjoyed working at Reiki Noonan assisting manufacturers um, for with Transactional Matters for almost 15 years. Um, with my short time period this morning, I just wanted to briefly go over some of the ways I regularly assist manufacturers in my practice. Uh, generally what I see um, me doing is assisting clients with mitigating risk and anticipating exposure and liabilities, whether this is in compliance or with newer changing regulations, um, entering into business transactions or protecting assets. I regularly assist people with negotiation review um, and providing advice with assistance to a, a wide variety of um, agreements between my clients and third parties. Uh, this includes um, anything from supply agreements, distribution agreements, manufacturing agreements, um, assisting with development and enforcement of purchase order terms and conditions, development of warranties for products, um, and putting together and negotiating different types of leases. Um, with unavoidable delays in supply chains due to COVID this year, the, the terms of those agreements have become even more at the forefront in determining people's options and liabilities and, and um, uh, different ways to, to work out um, what happens for delay and non-performance. In addition to the agreements with third parties, they also assist manufacturers with internal documents and issues. Uh, this includes entity formation, corporate governance matters, organizational documents, such as bylaws, operating agreements, um, buy, sell, and shareholder agreements, um, mergers, acquisitions, spinoffs, employment agreements, and independent contractor agreements. Other aspects of what I do for manufacturers um, deal with asset protection. This includes advice and assistance with registration, proper use and enforcement of trademarks, things like copyrights and trade secrets. Also the development of non-competition agreements, confidentiality agreements and license agreements, which have become more and more prevalent these days. It seems like the workforce seems more and more mobile and we've gotten more and more people asking about these and, and enforcing non-competes. Finally, I also assist with uh, business transitions as well. This is advice and assistance with development of efficient proper structure for things like ownership transitions, uh, mergers with third party companies, acquisitions, either assets or stocks, and different types of joint ventures with suppliers um, or people um, up the supply chain as well. Thank you for allowing us to sponsor the meeting today. Obviously this is a very high level overview of what I do and the services I can provide your businesses and different manufacturers. Um, if anyone has any questions, or would like to discuss any of these items in more further detail with me, feel free to reach out to me at my direct contact information below on the slides. Um, I'd be happy to discuss your concerns. And with that, I think I'm turning it over to, to Les. That's correct. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the February CMA meeting. Just uh, through these exciting times, I look forward to the day when we have a meeting where you won't get a virtual breakfast. You'll get the real thing. But uh, just, I think it's important, interesting thought of our organization. You know, we've put together some words to describe what we think is going on. That CMA continues to evolve, engage, create, achieve, grow, and succeed. And 
I think it's pretty amazing, even in these difficult times, how well we've done, quite frankly. So I think it's something to really be proud of as members and partners to this organization. And so, and now we do our normal introductions, which is a little complicated by this virtual activity. And I'll go through and just pick off a name because I've got a list that's just alphabetical. And if you're here, jump in, tell us who you are and what you do, and where you're from. So, and I've got uh, Wendy Hendricks. See if she's here. If I don't hear anything, we'll move on. And Julio Ampiero. Good morning, my name is Julio. I'm based in Minneapolis and I have a consulting business on technology and innovation for mid-sized manufacturers by making their, their products smart and connected to achieve new revenue streams. Nice to be here, thank you. All right, Mark Mueller. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Mark Mueller from Ayers and Ayers. We're a design build general contractor. We work on industrial facilities, either modifications or renovations, and we also build new buildings. Uh, Dexter Hansen. Good morning. My name is Dexter with Baghead Digital Marketing. We are a digital marketing agency right here in downtown St. Cloud. All right. Gordon Beckler. Christopher Davis. Eric Reisinger. I know he's here. Good morning. Eric Reisinger from Bremer Bank, Commercial Banking. And Chris, you were on mute. Yeah, hi, uh, Chris Davis with Bremer Bank as well with FX and International Services. Uh-huh, all right, he is. All right, Eric, go ahead. <laughs> and Jonathan Bartell, Bartell, really. Hey guys, Jonathan with Bredy Transportation in St. Joseph, Minnesota, and uh, glad to be here this morning. Great, Mark Hegstrom. Hey everybody, Mark Hegstrom here from Business Owner Succession Strategies down in the Twin Cities. Uh, we help business owners prepare to replace themselves so they can exit their business to get into retirement successfully. Uh, Mark Hegstrom with Boss. Yep. Jackie Larson. Dean Kiffmeyer. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dean Kiffmeyer with Central McGowan and a CMA board member. Tim Sapoy. Good morning, everybody. Tim Zippoy with Central Minnesota Jobs and Training Services and a CMMA board member. Luke Reardon. Hello, morning, everybody. Luke Reardon, Data Marketing. All right, Megan Imholt. Good morning, Megan Imholt, Doherty Staffing. We help companies find employees. Dwayne Warner. Good morning, I'm Dwayne. Uh, I have my own consulting business where I focus on operational excellence, organizational alignment, and strategic planning. All right, Rob Stark. Good morning, Rob Stark with Edward Jones out of Midtown Buffalo, partner with uh, individuals and businesses for wealth management strategies and uh, looking to uh, have a good uh, meeting with you, with you all today. Really good to see a lot of familiar faces. Thank you. Dennis Griffin. Hi, I'm Dennis Griffin with XM Bank. I'm in Minneapolis. Uh, it's nice to be here today. I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, how XM, we're, we're a federal agency, how we help finance your exports. Yeah, you'll hear a lot more from Dennis. So, Richard Owen. Yes, the Owen, uh, fairchanceemployer.com. Uh, we've authored a process and a website that helps uh, employers um, protect their company with compliance documentation and uh, evaluation process to help figure out how to hire folks with a criminal record. Jason Iverson. Good morning, Jason Iverson, Falcon National Bank, CMMA board member, also on the golf committee. Our uh, golf social is set for Tuesday, June 8th at Wapakata. Hope to see you all there. Sorry about the background noise here. So, uh, Tyler Nesro. Hello, I'm Tyler with Falcon National. I'm a commercial lender in Hamlet. 
And Jeremy Johnson. Good morning, Jeremy Johnson, Franzen Bank and Trust, uh, commercial advisory lending, also SBA lending here in Foley. All right, we got Sydney Barfening on today. Good morning. Yep, Sydney with Gaslight Creative. We're a full service marketing and advertising agency located both in St. Cloud and Minneapolis. All right, Paul Ruffin. Jeff Borling. Good morning, Jeff Borling with Great River Energy. I'm part of the economic development team at Great River Energy. We provide services and business expansion financing in Stearns Electric, East Central Energy, and 28 co-ops around the state. Thank you for having me. All right, Larry Hosh. Good morning, I'm Larry Hosh with Greater St. Cloud Development Corporation. We're a regional economic development agency serving Stearns, Benton, and Sherburne counties. Sarah Hansen. Douglas Cook. Morning, Doug Cook, Headwater Strategic Succession. I help business owners um, address the enterprise value of their company, uh, whether they're planning a strategic exit or I just wanna be ready for market conditions. I'm also chair of the CMA MA Marketing Committee and it's good to see a lot of our members on the committee here today. Thank you. And all of you. Yes, David Miller. Good morning, David Miller. I'm a commercial loan officer at Kensington Bank and I office in downtown St. Cloud. I'm also the chair of your membership committee. All right, Jeffrey Larson. Jackie Bistodo. Bistodo. I'll mess Jackie that up. Bistodo. Jackie Bistodo. That's all right. <laughs> Keep us to do CPA with LB Carlson. So accounting, tax, business planning, management, consulting. Thanks. Julia Contreras. Mark Willett. Mark, hi, I'm Mark Willett. There we go. Vice President of Mark Tech International. We'll be talking to you about export development, and I'll be moderating the discussion. Right, and Michael Flockenese. Good morning, uh, nice to be here, because I'm the owner of Marktech International. We focus on um, sales executive development, international export sales and channel development. I'm one of the speakers, looking forward to sharing more information with you about global markets and opportunities for everybody. Thank you. Right, you hear a lot more from those fellows shortly. So Andrew Burt. Joe Wolf, Amy Johnson. Good morning. I'm I think Amy we Johnson got her. Again. She's on here, but she's always on. <laughs> it's like the real story is, folks. She's the brains of this operation. Well, thanks, Les. So, Joe LaRose, Mike Slew. Martha Spiker, speaker. Brian Sweeney. Brody Miller. Good morning again, Brody Miller, Rinky Noonan. All right, we had him. And Trisha Hendrickson. Hi, good morning. I'm Trisha Hendrickson with Rinky Noonan. And Bruce Hegberg. Bruce is here, he's muted. Is that it? I guess I was gonna say, I thought he should be here. <laughs> Hi, sorry, Bruce Hagberg, Right Soft, <laughs> also the chair of the uh, CMMA program committee. That's right, we'll get there. So, and I know Angie's here, Angie Brick. Good morning, Angie Brick from Roto Chopper and also a CMMA board member. And Nick Schwime. Nick Schwime, Spectrum Commercial Services. So I'm a non-bank line of credit working capital lender. Mm -hmm. Eric Micheletti, Leslie Berglund. Hi, I'm Leslie Berglund from Trade Acceptance Group, and I'm one of the presenters today, and we work with companies that are exporting and want to ensure their accounts receivable. All right, Lauren Altschuler. Good job. Hi, good morning, everyone. Lauren Altschuler with Transworld Business Advisors. I help people acquire businesses and also list their business confidentially for sale. I'm also on the marketing committee. Great. Right. Jessica Wells. 
Kurt Gainsworth, and Matt Laubach. Now, I just had the list of who registered. That's why we have some you didn't hear from. If there's anybody I missed, speak up. We're sorry we missed you. We got everybody. All right. Well, we got a few announcements to get through here. I'm not too far behind. So, and I think Amy's going to make the slides come up, but we got some milestone anniversaries. So five-year anniversaries, heirs and heirs, and also granted partners. <clears throat> and for 10-year anniversary, Cold Spring. And so we'll also welcome some new members that we've got, Agency North Real Estate, Empero Partners, and DeGraff Financial. So thank you for everybody that are the new members. Appreciate everybody being involved and some updates. So encourage everybody to go look at the CMA website and it's just CMA works. And here you can see what it sort of looks like. Important to notice as you're looking at that screen at the top it says workforce, because I'm gonna tell you more about where to go there to get other things. And also remind you that the marketing series we've been doing March 17th will be another presentation on the platform options for digital prospecting. So you can register on the CMA website under the events tab. And the Youth Apprenticeship Toolkit, as you see coming up here, why, in just a second. And really encourage everybody, this works for the educators and the uh, manufacturers. In fact, all businesses really, it's not just manufacturing, to find youth, youth that are 16, to 17 years old in school that can actually work in your business and training programs for experienced careers. And, and the big one of announcements is that the next one you'll see come up is the K-12 Navigator is what we call it. <clears throat> and again, uh, you can find this off the website under that workforce area. And if you look at this, this is where students, parents, educators, can come in to search out companies. And so down below, you'll see the manufacturer section. If you're a manufacturer, I encourage you to register. You just click that register button. It'll come up with a screen. You fill in the information you want, and then it'll be approved by CMMA and uploaded onto the site. And a really big thank you, since we've been pushing to get this thing loaded with manufacturers, is that I checked a minute ago, and we're up to 17 people have loaded in there. So just need everybody else to get on board. So when the students are looking for things, they can get help from manufacturers, they can find you. So it, it's easy to use, not much to it. And so now what we're gonna do is a little bit change of pace is Mark Willett is gonna, they're coming up with some audience polling. So watch for these questions, answer them quickly because they're gonna use those to create the questions for the networking breakouts that'll happen right after that. So I think it should be ready to go here if all works well. Okay. Amy's gonna put those up. Okay, do you currently export your products or services? And for this group, maybe emphasize services. There's your results. Uh -huh. So it looks like five out of 30 that responded do, 25 out of 30 do not. Would you like to try another question mark? All right. Uh, muted. Is Mark muted? Yes. That'll slow him down a little bit. 
A little bit, yes. Yeah. It keeps muting me. <laughs> Are your products or components you make exported by your customers in their products? And this could be extended to services as well. If you're working for someone uh, that is doing international business. Still have answers coming in, so just stay a second. I like that I don't have to tally all these. And... <laughs> to see how quick you are. <laughs> okay. Yeah, not quick. There you go. We have some. You know, this group is um, above average, as we like to say in central Minnesota. All right, we have one more question here. Here we go. Have you ever used export credit insurance before? And drum roll. Whoa. We have some that have used it and 7% is very high actually for US markets. Well, these are the questions that we will be addressing in our presentation today, but we thought it would be a good way to tee up the, uh, the group, the out, uh, the breakout sessions. So if you are doing international business or are interested in doing international business, um, this is an opportunity to network with other CMMA members and, uh, and with our presenters too. So Amy, right. do you um, do the breakout now? for five minutes or? Yes, Mark, can you, can you, based on the answers of the polls that were given, can you give us a question for the first breakout or our, our talking points? Okay, well, these will be my talking points in our presentation as well, when most companies in the US don't export. And so, and, and most companies don't import either. They're not involved in international business. What, what our question today for you is, how can you engage your company in the global market? Because 70% of the purchasing power in the world is not in the US. So maybe for the first question is, how do you engage in international? And I will broadcast that question once you get in your rooms as well. This is five minutes. We will see you soon. All right, we've returned again. Well, this is great. I like the conversations that, that I was on. Well, good, good. And it's glad to hear that. So, well, folks, we're getting ready. Now you can hear how this really works about this <laughs> exporting and all those details. But so, and we, as you know, as you figured out, we've got a panel of speakers that are going to try to explain some of these things to you. I have to admit, I was a little concerned when he gave up the statistic that 70% of the buying power is outside the US. Um, that's sort of a sobering thought, <clears throat> but I'd like to welcome the folks that are here. So for a panel, so with us is 
It's Michael Lockanese, and he's the president of Mark Tech International. And we got Dennis Griffin, you've been hearing from, director of Minneapolis Regional Office at the Export Import Bank, United States. And Leslie Berglund, owner of Trade Acceptance Group. And moderating today's discussion is Mark Willett, vice president of Mark Tech International, who you've been hearing from. So well, with that, we're going to turn it over to you folks. Go for it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as, as uh, Les mentioned, I'm Vice President of Mark Tech International, and I have 30 years of international business experience, uh, exporting and importing. Um, I specialize in new products and technologies for new markets, and I've done international joint ventures, collaborations, licensing, and consulting, and, uh, and exporting, as we've kind of discussed, is about sales, and it's about establishing relationships and we help you build new relationships and new customers. That's, that's who we are. So we have uh, a question for you today. And the question is, are you open for business with the world? Because according to the US Department of Commerce, each year US companies export well over 2 trillion, that's with a T, dollars of goods and services. In the US, more than 280,000 companies export. However, that is less than 1% of America's 30 million companies, a percentage that is significantly lower than all developed countries. And of the 280,000 US companies that do export, 58% export to only one country. That would be probably Canada or Mexico, but not both. The good news is you can be an exporter. More than two thirds of exporting companies are less than 20 employees. But these only account for less than 30% of the value of exports. Developing your export sales has never been easier. We want to thank you for joining us today at CMMA to explore how your business can expand your export sales and how to get paid. Now you might ask, why should you expand your export sales? Well, access to new markets has never been easier, even in a pandemic. Demand, 70% of the purchasing power as Les mentioned, is outside the US. Improved top line and bottom line profitability, and maybe more important for this group, improved valuation of your company. We have brought together an expert panel to walk us through how you can expand your export sales and get paid. And first, I want to let each of the panelists uh, introduce themselves. Michelle, how about if you start? Sure. Good morning. Thank you very much for all for attending. I really appreciate it. Had a great discussion in our, our first uh, panel or discussion uh, group. Unfortunately, I got kicked out of Zoom by this in the second group, so I had to re-log in. So sorry about two guys that were there. I didn't mean to uh, leave you hanging, but technology is great when it works and not so good when it doesn't. So Anyway, I just want to give you a brief background on myself. Like I say, I have a very difficult last name. My, French, my father was French, but I'm born in Sweden, Stockholm, Sweden, actually. So I came over here as a student many moons ago. Uh, I've spent the last 35 years uh, working for Minnesota-based manufacturing companies, um, in focusing on helping them export outside of the United States, expand sales channels, set up distributor networks. My companies I worked for have all been in the SME category, $5 million up to $200 million. Uh, variety of industries, uh, IT, aerospace, automotive, uh, even waste collection, recycling, and some uh, several other industries. So I have a very broad-based knowledge of technology, industrial, you know, those type of products. Some of them even had like a service business where we, we actually perform service for clients as well. Um, I started my own company, MarkTech, about five years ago. And wanted to take the knowledge and experience I have and share that and help 
small you know, soda based companies, you know, expand outside of the US, help them grow sales and profitability. Um, our company, we, we work as sort of a um, sales executive for hire or fractional partial uh, sales for hire. We do both short term projects with specific goal or development for a client. Um, or on an ongoing basis, we have some clients we've worked with for over four years, helping them expand in all different parts of the world. Typically work with the owner, the president, and the senior management team of the company. Um, and like once again, our clients work in anything from wood processing equipment to high-tech welding systems and everything in between. Uh, we typically work with, say, three or six clients at any given time. And uh, we work, work with them to sort of develop an international business plan. Thank you very much. Okay, how about uh, Dennis, are you ready? Yes. Um, so I put together a few slides, so maybe it'd be best if I introduce- well, How about if you oh. introduce yourself first? Okay, I'm uh, with uh, the Export Import Bank of the United States. Uh, we're a federal agency. I'm a business development uh, person with uh, with XM here in Minneapolis. And uh, what I do is help uh, companies understand what it is we do uh, and in addition to that, I'm what's called a broker account manager, uh, which is a new role. XM uh, created a role for people like me to work specifically with our brokers. And uh, the reason for that is uh, our brokers are an integral part of uh, working with uh, US small businesses. So in all deals that we do, we have a broker uh, engaged and here in Minneapolis or in Minnesota, we we have uh, one broker based here. That's that's a trade credit specialist, and and that's uh, Trade Acceptance Group. And uh, Leslie's on the call, and she'll be explaining uh, what it is they do. So, uh, yes, that that's what I'd like to leave it with there, and I'll okay. go through a few more things uh, in a few minutes. Sure, okay. Leslie, please introduce yourself. Hello, good morning. Um, so I'm Leslie Berglund, Trade Acceptance Group, uh, one of the initial founders uh, from back in 1996, after spending about 17 years in the, or 19 years in the banking, international banking industry. Um, so we primarily work with companies that are exporting, um, that have to ship to their customers before they get paid. And so how do they mitigate the risk of potentially not getting paid by that foreign buyer? And the way to do that is to um, have accounts receivable insurance. So we work very closely with Dennis and Exim Bank uh, for uh, goods that are made in the US and shipped from the US that qualify under the Exim Bank program. Uh, we also work with private sector insurers with those companies that either want to include domestic receivables along with their export, or they have products that don't qualify under the XM regulations. Um, so we have the whole gamut of, of, of options. And, but for small companies, um, XM Bank is the most user-friendly and the most uh, economical. And generally XM Bank is the, um, has more countries that they're open to uh, insuring whereas the private sector insurers are um, proactively managing their, their exposures. And so they're, they're constantly expanding and contracting um, the countries that they're willing to cover and the companies in, that, in those countries. Mm -hmm. So basically we're working with companies that need help with uh, the pre-export finance and post-export finance and working with their banks um, particularly if the banks need to have, uh, the buyer needs to have, or the exporter needs to have credit insurance on those foreign accounts receivable to be able to include them in a borrowing base. So we kind of step over onto the finance side, the insurance side, and then just a little bit on um, advising on logistics for, uh, for exports. Great, thank you. Well, my first question is, uh, for Michelle, and based on your experience working for uh, large companies, as you mentioned, and even small local companies, 
how, what are the key steps to start an export program? You're, you're uh, muted, Michelle. Sorry, technology again, there you go. <laughs> anyway, so uh, thanks for the question, Mark. Uh, like I said, actually, even in my, my first um, discussion with a group uh, that I actually got a chance to participate in, this actually came up. And typically the way uh, a Minnesota-based company gets started in exporting is one of two ways, uh, kind of the accidental exporter that Mark mentioned. One way, and I'll give an example for one of our clients uh, in Pine River, Minnesota, a little manufacturer there, a couple million dollars in sales to make firewood processing equipment. They had this crazy guy uh, contact them on their website and then call from New Zealand. And it was a one man operation and he was just enamored with their product and he wanted to buy it. You know, can I get a container load of it? So that, well, you know, it's like we don't know anything about exporting, you know, but you know, if the guy wants to buy something, it's an extra sale, but take the revenue, um, send us the money ahead of time, here's our bank account. And um, off we went. Now there was really no, no plan, no really idea who the guy was, uh, what's he gonna do with it? What's the market opportunity? If this guy wants to do that in New Zealand, why couldn't Germany be a big market for us? So that's how they got started. So there really wasn't any kind of thinking or plan behind it, but somebody contacted them, money in hand, and they were ready to sell. The second one actually came up in our discussion, um, the breakout session. Uh, a lot of times, most of you have, you know, a number of customers in the U.S. A lot of those companies are probably much more global or exporting themselves. So you might supply parts or services to them. And then they suddenly ask you to supply their factory in Germany. Let's say John Deere, for example, they have you know, a number of factories in Germany. They have factories in China and everything else. And they expect a lot of their suppliers to be able to supply them globally. So you kind of get pushed into it, whether you really you know, have the plan or not to do it. And that's happening more and more, uh, even with a lot of small suppliers. And we had an interesting discussion in the breakout session that on average, the, the, part, the cars we drive in, in the US right now, uh, most of the parts in those cars have crossed the border 33 times on average. In other words, so you have a part made in, in Ohio, it's shipped to somewhere in Mexico, they put a coating on, it goes back to the US, they do something, they ship it to Canada and back and forth and back and forth. So that's the reason why there was such a shortage of, of new cars last spring and summer when the borders shut down. So the, 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 there's more and more, so many of our day-to-day -day products we have actually are made in a number of different places when you put it all together. So um, there's a little tiny company in Bloomington here called Donaldson, about $2 billion in sales. They got started the same way. Uh, they were, Cat, Cat was one of their biggest customers for filters for different types of engines. You know, Cat went into China, Cat went into Europe and Donaldson followed along. And now they have, in China, they have 10 factories in, in China and do about 600 million in revenue. So it's, it is one way that you can sort of start doing the exporting. You have customers that do it. Um, it's a good method, but it's not really a plan so what we try to do to help our clients is basically put together an export plan, you know, with specific information, you do some research. So kind of in general, what you want to do is, you know, who are your main customers? Um, what markets, what industries are they in? Uh, looking at, you know, the world is the big place. So where do you get started? And you don't want to just spray and pray all over the world, but you know, where do you think sort of your products would have the, the most interest? Where do you get most inquiries from in, internationally on your website? Um, take that information, do some market research. There are, there are tools available that we can offer or also the Minnesota Trade Office, other agencies have information as well to help you determine sort of where, where would be good markets for me to start and, and build up a business with. Uh, look at, is there any particular regulations, certifications you have to have to say go into Europe? Um, what kind of competitors do you have? You know, do you have some advantages? Do you have a strong IP patents and things like that? Uh, and then once again, go back, look at existing customers. Who are the people you work, you sell to right now that know you already are operating in the markets that you want to go into. So that's kind of how you tie it all in. You want to put together a plan and make sure that so you get the buy-in from the whole organization because it does require 
more of a, of a team commitment to get into international. It's finance, it's sales, it's marketing, it's logistics, it's engineering. You're going to have to deal with air warranty issues and selling, selling spare parts overseas, for example, those type of things. So it's put together a plan once you realize that there is actually a, a good market opportunity for us. The company Pine River, for example, because they sell firewood processing equipment, the main market for them outside the US was actually in Europe, especially Germany, Scandinavia, some of the other countries. So that was the sort of focus of the initial plan that we put together for them, including helping them get certification for their equipment. So that's kind of the general idea of what we're trying to help companies to do to make it easier and to help them avoid a lot of the pitfalls of maybe going overseas. Okay. Great, thank you. Say, Dennis, can you describe how the Exim Bank uh, Express program for small and mid-sized companies and how it works. I think lots of people think that Exim only serves the big Boeings and, uh, and, and the 3Ms and those kind of companies, but how does it, how, how can you serve uh, small companies? Okay, so you're right. Most people think that we only serve the large uh, companies, but actually 90% uh, of the transactions that we do on a yearly basis uh, are in support of small businesses. So that's, that's something that, that's not well understood. We have an operation in place in Washington of underwriters uh, that are experts in, in you know, making credit decisions, companies around the world. So, uh, 90 percent of the transactions small business however uh, when you look at the amount of dollars we support um, you know project finance around you know for projects around the world supporting transportation deals in uh, various industries aircraft automotive uh, locomotive so uh, those are big big deals we also have an organization that that does that in, in DC. So express insurance is for the new to export uh, small business. Uh, it's, it's priced very effectively. It's 0.65% uh, times your export sales amount, independent of the country you're shipping to is, is, is the cost. There's no real upfront cost. So uh, 0.65% times a, you know, $10,000 shipment is only $65. So uh, the cost of, of insuring receivables is, is um, it's, it's economical, it's, it's easy to get into. And, um, you know, it's, it's important that companies look to insure their receivables internationally, particularly if they're shipping into uh, developing countries. Uh, it's, it's less important uh, if you're shipping to the developed world um, or if you know the company very well. So um, does that answer your question? Sure, sure. Okay. Leslie, when should a company start to contact you? Hey, um... We would prefer that a company contact us sooner rather than later um, as their export sale is developing as they're in discussions with their, with their buyer or they're looking at new markets. Um, it's, we wanna make sure that we've covered kind of all the potential scenarios that they might encounter depending on the type of product that they're selling, who they're selling it to, if they're selling it through a distributor or they're selling directly to an end user, um, that kind of thing. So uh, it's it's all it's all of those things. It's based on country and buyer type and um, and product. So the sooner that we can get in involved and um, understand what the, the basic structure is, uh, if there is something there that's not really going to be workable from the trade credit insurance side, then we want to identify it and maybe think of another way to go about it. Um, as far as getting an application and actually applying for the credit insurance coverage, um, we need lead time there, probably a good two months or so. Um, 
Certainly, we don't want to wait until after the goods have been shipped. Um, it's too late then. It's definitely too late when the, um, the invoice comes due and the buyer doesn't pay. That's, you know, like any type of insurance, you have to have it before you actually initiate your transaction. So, um, so that we've got kind of this long window, but the sooner the better. And, you know, we're happy to talk to people about their situation, give them suggestions of what they need to do next. Um, or in some cases, how we may not be able to help them, but we can refer them to other people who might be able to do that. There could be a transaction that would be better suited for a letter of credit transaction versus an insured open account transaction. So again, talking about the specifics, um, you know, in a situation, we're happy to talk about, you know, generalities and things, but we find that um, until there's a uh, a specific sale that's developing, um, you know, it sometimes our answers get kind of lost in translation um, because they're not specific to um, that, um, that particular scenario. Yeah. So Michelle, what type of sales channels or sales methods do you typically re recommend that people look at and why? Yeah, I'd say um, this one, of add a little comment to both Leslie and Dennis. Sure. So we, we've had a number of clients that actually have, you know, started exporting and used the Exim Bank uh, foreign credit insurance. It's, it's a really good program. And the main reason to use it is really to, once again, a lot of your competitors overseas have very generous uh, government uh, grants and export programs. So they can offer, say, you know, long, much longer term, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, I know one of one of the clients back in time where there, there was a company in Vietnam that wanted two year terms, and we talked to we talked to Dennis and Leslie as well, and we found a Canadian bank that was willing to do long payment terms. Of course, they came to a, with a higher interest than everything else, and at the end of the day, uh, the client and and the buyer end up reaching agreement to payment terms of six months rather than the, the, the crazy two years. But once again, it gives you a lot of flexibility and allow you to be more competitive. So anyway, getting back to the sales channel. So, so once you decided you are gonna go internationally or you have opportunities um, and you can look at, well, what sales, who should I sell to? Or you know, what type of customers do I wanna have and go after? And of course, it's, it's a little bit relevant, of course, to your product or services you have, but there's there's a fair number of sort of traditional, you know, people or sales channels, I call them, that you normally would look at. So the most common one, uh, especially, you know, say you go back a little bit in time is, is you find a distributor. So a distributor is somebody that would basically be your direct customer. They would buy from you, place the order, they would pay you. Um, they would then, you know, either have you ship it to them or they manage the shipment, importation into the country. They do a lot of promotion. Uh, they typically would keep some inventory or products. So they would kind of be like your local representative in, in a country or a region, uh, whatever you select to do. Um, sometimes they might even you know, help you on the war doing the warranty repair work or replace parts. Uh, depending upon the size and, and how they're set up, they might have a service team as well. Um, the good thing is that you don't have to have a lot of your own administration or staff to deal with a distributor. Uh, the downside is, of course, the distributor expects to you know, make a certain amount of profit. So you end up having to give discounts off of your sort of traditional uh, list or end user retail price. Um, another type of channel, which can also be in addition to your distributor, would be going one step closer to the actual end user or buyer of your product. So that would be like a dealer. Like I say, you travel around Minnesota, you see John Deere dealers in many, many towns, right? So that's somebody that, that you manufacturer would sell directly to, and then they sell to the farmer or whoever buys their equipment. So the resellers, they you know, tend to have, they tend to buy in smaller quantities. So there's more order processing, more administration, more shipping and logistics. Um, the good thing is that you don't have to give them quite as much of a discount. So you make more money on the individual sale um, you also probably have to do more of the actually support of the customer, any type of repairs, warranty issues you have to typically deal with directly yourself. Um, and then 
a third channel, which for example, the company in Pine River that we've been working with is they actually started sort of having an e-commerce site. And you know, there's a lot of digital marketing companies in the, in the membership as well. So they can help you sort of set up a, a site that is not just to present the information, but actually to take orders. So um, like I said, as, as more and more people are buying more products, for example, for Christmas, I didn't even enter a, any retail store whatsoever. Amazon is one of my happy homes, uh, bought lots and lots of products. And when you look at where they actually come from, um, more than half are coming from somewhere overseas. You know, I ordered a, a, a purse from my, one of my daughters that came in five days from Jakarta, Indonesia, for example, for $20 plus a little bit of shipping. So it, it's more and more the things that we, even whether we buy or sell, have, you know, international um, aspects to it. Um, there's a, another channel that is very popular overseas. So even in the US, here we call them manufacturer sales representative firms. So it's somebody that doesn't buy the product themselves from you. They rather sell on your behalf. So they typically have a portfolio of products. Uh, typically, it should be fairly complimentary. So they go in and visit uh, a particular customer. They can talk about product A, B, C, whatever they have when they're into their visiting uh, as well. It, you would actually do the actual selling and negotiating the price with the, the buyer of the product, and then you pay them a commission on their sales. So once again, that's typically say a five to 10% commission. Another very popular way of doing business overseas. Uh, a lot of parts of the world, they call them agents, but the way they work is pretty much the same way. Um, there's a couple of more you know, sales channels, you know, way to market your product that I also wanna address. These are probably more uh, suitable for a manufacturer of a product or technology. Uh, one is a licensing agreement. So you have this Wizback product technology and somebody says, you know, I like to make that in Europe. You know, can I, can I license the technology from you? In other words, you give them the know-how, you help them set up production and everything else. And, you know, so instead of you having to market the product in Europe yourself, you have this other company do it. So you get into a more of a longer discussion negotiations where you would actually get a, a one-time license fee. Um, done a situation like that, for example, a company in China where the company I worked for, we got a $100,000 license fee and then we get a, a annual royalty on their sales. So they actually are paying you a percentage of what they sell the products they make under license of your technology. So that was a 7% royalty. And sometimes you can also get uh, so annual fees related to sort of uh, maintenance and management support for it. So it's, it's a way to, instead of you having to do the selling yourself, you license the technology and you get a, a revenue stream from that on an ongoing basis. It does require a lot of due diligence to make sure that it's a trustworthy partner and, and uh, have a really ironclad agreement. You need a very good lawyer that's familiar with this as well. But all of it, it, it's something that a lot of companies do very successfully. And then finally, uh, it, it's the last sort of sales channel you can look at would be to what I call a private label arrangement. Like I say, when you go into, you know, whether it's Colburn or Cub or any type of grocery store, you see their house brands. Now, it doesn't mean that Colburn manufactures cereal and mustard and ketchup. They have negotiated with the manufacturer of those products to have their own brand. You know, so they are basically, they put their own label on it, but somebody else makes it for them. Very, very popular way to do, and it'll help you as a manufacturer. You get your increased volume, um, and you can lower your cost in your purchasing of the raw material and everything else. So that's a private label arrangement. So these are all not like you can only do one. Uh, most companies have multiple ways of selling their products, two or three different ways. But that's kind of part of what our service and what we help companies with is to understand, analyze and see what, where are the opportunities for me to sell and who to sell to. That's kind of part of, of the system of, of going internationally as well. More opportunities, more channels to look at. Okay. Great. Um, Dennis, you, you mentioned and, and Michelle also uh, mentioned that there's a strategic aspect to this uh, from, you could say, from a government standpoint as well. And, and that the Exim Bank is part of our strategy. Um, can you tell us about kind of 
maybe one the practical how it works and then what's that strategy and how it supports US products abroad. Well, you had our, some slides too, I think. Our mission is, uh, is to support American jobs uh, through export finance. Um, that's, we know that uh, companies that export uh, tend to uh, tend to uh, make more money. Uh, they tend to uh, be able to sell product. Uh, let's say they're in a cyclical business. They're able to sell product uh, around the world uh, when maybe they're, this cycle's down in the US. So the reason we're here is to support US companies export sales so that they hire more people. It's just that simple. Um, we do this in a way that, um, you know, the key point that I'd like to make is uh, over the last 10 years, the number of governments around the world that support their own exporters and I say over the last 10 years, it, it, it's not by coincidence. It, it's coming out of the Great Recession. A lot of countries around the world beefed up their export support uh, so that uh, their, their companies would be successful. Um, so, you know, essentially the number of governments that do this went from 50 to 100 in the last 10 years. That means that US companies that are going out to export uh, are competing against the support of uh, foreign governments. So US companies need to know, and they don't, uh, you know, if, if you don't know much about Exim Bank, uh, congratulations, you're, you're part of the 97% of, of companies in, in the US, um, but, you know, we're here to make, to have, uh, to provide tools for you so you can compete against not only foreign companies, but their governments that are very aggressive in supporting their exporters. In fact, China has four Exim banks. So, and it's not just China, it's every developed country in the world. And then, a lot of the top developing countries that you're competing against. So what this means is if, if you go in, first of all, uh, the terms of sale with this, this description that I'm giving to you impacts the terms of sale of any particular deal. So you should try to get cash in advance whenever you can but this scenario that I'm describing is putting pressure on getting cash in advance and shifting terms towards offering open account sales. And that's where we come in as XM. We protect, we ensure your risk of offering open account sales. Um, but every company, every industry is different. If you, it, who has the leverage in a transaction? Is it you, the, the, the seller, or is it the buyer? You know, if, if you're making a specialized product or a specialized service, the leverage might go in your favor. So you, you may be able to dictate the terms of sale, but as your product becomes perhaps more commoditized, uh, then perhaps the buyer is dictating the terms of sale. So one thing we suggest that you do is, it's very typical not to find that out and too late in the discussion. That's just human nature. Uh, the sooner you can bring forward that in the discussion, the terms of sale, uh, the better for you uh, in, in your chances of, of getting a particular deal. Uh, because what happens a lot and, and this, this happens all the time. Uh, the seller was expecting cash in advance, the buyer was expecting credit terms, and then it sort of all falls apart there. 
but you'd be surprised how many times now the buyer tells the seller to contact XM Bank because the buyers know more about XM Bank than than our U.S. sellers. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to uh, put that out there that uh, you know feel free uh, to get a hold of of me, get get a hold of Leslie. Uh, with any of these questions, we we're very happy to to discuss your your situation with you. Well, and that's the point of this this uh, this program is to introduce the people. And Leslie, do you have some examples of how clients have leveraged uh, XM Bank and and how you've helped them? Sure. How much time do you have? Uh, about. <laughs> <laughs> Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, a typical situation um, that we see for a, uh, it could be a manufacturing company, it could be a services company, is that they win um, a, a fairly good size order and uh, October sees the buyer says, okay, I need you to, to give me 60 day terms from the, the date of the invoice or the date of the bill of lading. And, um, and then they win the order and then they find out that they need financing to be able to produce the goods that they're going to be shipping. So they go to a bank and a bank says, well, you know, you haven't, you haven't shipped yet. So, you know, we, we can't advance money against a receivable that you haven't booked yet. You know, your product is still considered inventory on your balance sheet. So they end up talking with a, um, a specialty lender that uses the Small Business Administration program for working capital. And so we partner up with that bank and that bank offers what we call the pre-export financing. So they provide, based on a confirmed purchase order, they provide a portion of the money needed to, um, to the exporter so that they can buy the raw materials or they can uh, buy the product or they can uh, cover their work in process before they're getting it ready to ship. And so they they borrow from a bank um, a certain portion against that, that order. And um, then once the exporter ships the product, then they're covered by the, the credit insurance. And so they can have coverage of up to 95%. So if the buyer, so if the buyer defaults, it doesn't pay, then we claim on the insurance and the, the uh, exporter has the ability then to use the proceeds from the claim payment to pay off their loan to the bank. So oftentimes, uh, and I had a conversation like this earlier this week where um, a, a middleman is looking at um, capital equipment that is, um, you know, was almost $9 million and he's got this great contract for selling to Brazil. But when I asked him how he was going to get the money to purchase the goods before they had to be refurbished and, and sent, he said, oh, I hadn't thought of that. He goes, <laughs> I, I'll have to work with my bank. And I said, well, the fact that you have the sales contract doesn't mean that the bank's going to give you that money without some kind of support. So the U.S. government both SBA and Exim Bank can uh, guarantee a bank to be able to have that bank lend to the exporter to um, make the goods that are gonna be exported. And then once they are exported and there's an account receivable, then SBA or Exim will require that the exporter have the credit insurance to cover the, the potential for default. Um, and a banker will require that as well. Great. Well, and I had this happen to me once where I, I made a presentation, introduced a U.S. manufacturer. We had a, a deal on the table. It, it was the best, he was the best pizza uh, equipment manufacturer, designer uh, in, in, in the U.S. But the uh, foreign company came in and offered one year free money. It's hard to compete. 
Right. Right. We we hadn't even got to terms at all, even in our discussion yet. Mm -hmm. And and so having that ability and having that kind of leverage with the U.S. government to at least offer terms is is so critical. Yes. Uh, in the discussion. Yeah, and I can give an example too. Um, it's, it's a company that both Leslie and Dennis knows well. American Time in Dassel, Minnesota, population 1,400, I think, 15 miles north of uh, Hutchinson. Um, they are selling, you know, time management clock systems for schools and businesses and whatever else. And they had a, a product in Kuwait, of all places, where the government of Kuwait had uh, put aside two billion dollars to build nine new universities. Uh, from from scratch, and they were involved in this project. We were going to build a university, a technical university, and uh, American Times system go, is one of the last things that go into the construction. You know, they build the building, they break the ground, they put the building together, and then they start putting all the different systems in there. And this was at the very tail end, and they were competing with Chinese manufacturers of clocks and time management systems. And they used uh, Exim Bank and and Leslie for their foreign credit insurance. And they got an order, I think it was a $150,000 order. So, I mean, it, it's significant amount of money for them as far as their export sales were in that, say, half million dollar category. So it bumped up their export sales that year significantly, but they couldn't have taken on the risk without the help of Exxon and, and Leslie from that aspect. So, Can I jump in with a question? Yeah, uh, sure. With some of your successful clients, are they, you, you mentioned earlier, and I think Dennis, it was you that mentioned it, that they're uh, most uh, buyers from outside the US are aware, or it's more often that buyers are aware of XM Bank. Are you finding that manufacturers are using this in their marketing to showcase their relationship that they already have established with XM Bank in order to attract more buyers? Has that been a beneficial thing or have you heard of manufacturers doing that? I'd say it's not widespread that it depends. Uh, I have seen some equipment manufacturers uh, that that bring out our medium term financing, which is, you know, if you're an equipment manufacturer that uh, selling more than $250,000 worth of equipment, uh, there are financial institutions in the U.S. that will finance that for five years. I think in that situation, uh, those manufacturers want to bring that forward and, and show that that is an option uh, because it is the Chinese, the Italians, the Germans, they bring that forward and present that right away, that type of financing. So it, that's my impression. Les, Leslie? Yeah, that, I mean that's very true on the on the equipment side. On the the short term side, um, it really depends on the um, the reason for a company that would want to use credit insurance. If they want to just use it for one off deals, they want to use it for new customers, they want to use it for entering a new market. Um, then you know if if they know there's competition, especially that is supported you know, like a German or French that we know there's going to be support from their, or China, support from their government, um, then they want to make, uh, you know, their customer aware that they could do something similar. Um, so again, it depends by product, it depends on how widespread the company's exports are in terms of the variety of countries that they sell to. Uh, it depends on whether or not the exporter has used some of the other government programs, the uh, gold key service that the Department of Commerce uh, offers in country to help define markets and help the exporters find distributors or agents. Um, and usually, you know, Exim Bank's products are, are, are part of that presentation. So it, yeah, it's, it's kind of all over the place, whether or not some people are, um, aware of it. The one thing I would say is that our most recent experience has been where the, the foreign buyer uh, told the, the seller that they should use XM Bank. And so they sent in an application and uh, they were almost too slick in terms of 
saying, here's how Exim Bank is going to work. And then once we started getting all the pieces of credit information put together in the application, we discovered that it was a fraudulent transaction. So, you know, there's that side of it too, where if the buyer is a little bit too aware of how XM works, either, you know, they already work with other suppliers that are selling to them using XM support, or it's part of a scam. Yeah. So again, yeah. it's, it's very much, what's your situation? Who are the parties? How well do you know your, your, your buyer, your customer? Um, you know, make sure they aren't on any bad guy list with the government. Um, you know, just it, it's just a whole can of worms, but you want to make sure that, um, you know, everything passes the smell test. Uh, because again, it's so easy these days to have somebody hijack an email and um, act as the intermediary pretending to be, you know, one of the other parties. That's, that's yeah. another reason why we suggest using a broker because Leslie and Mason, who, who works with uh, Leslie down here in Minneapolis, uh, their expertise, uh, you know, they understand when something doesn't pass the smell test and having that kind of expertise on your side when you're exporting is, is very important. And yeah. I mean, from, uh, from the, let's say from the menu, some clients that we have had or are working with, um, there tend to be smaller companies, so the companies you deal with tend to be smaller, so they're not necessarily aware of Exim Bank, but it, it gets down to that the buyer himself doesn't, might not be a big company. For example, we had a company in the UK, they, they were sales about a, a, about a million a million pounds, so 1.3 million or something like that. They wanted to buy container loans, but that, in, that got the price tag up to $60,000, $70,000. And of course, you have the production time, the shipping time, the importation, and he had to sell it. So he was he he needed to have so about 60, 90 day payment terms in order to, to make it all work. The advantage for our client in Pine River was that you know I, I can produce six or eight of these machines that are running about ten thousand dollars a piece, whatever. Um, and also on the shipping cost, if you ship one of these machines, they have weighed about 15, 1,500 pounds. Ship one would cost about $2,000, you ship six, the cost per unit was 500. So the shipping cost suddenly became a big percentage of the cost and you were fighting with European made manufacturers of similar equipment or at least similar purpose equipment. So shipping costs could really add up to the cost of an export that you have to take into account and by them be able to offer this company in the UK financing through Exxon Bank and through Leslie with foreign credit insurance they could actually sell in larger volume, higher revenue months right away instead of sort of waiting over time as this company builds up the business and have more cash. So um, it, it's been a great tool for these are actually very small manufacturers, you know, a couple of million dollars in sales, the one out west here in, in um, DAS, about $10 million in sales. So it's a great tool. It's just, it's the best kept secrets in the universe. Right, Dennis? It's very true. So um, I'm running. Oh, I'm go ahead. To add one one quick comment. So you know, when Michelle, you had mentioned that you know uh, accidental exporters might get an order through their through the internet. Um, what it comes down to is, you know, we we have a willing buyer or an interested buyer. Um, that's great, but the credit insurance is not going to cover the risk of a buyer that's not financially viable. And so, what I like to say is. Credit insurance does not make a bad credit good, okay? It's going to reveal how strong financially that customer is. And so if nothing else, this is a good way to uh, pre-screen the buyers. Are they legitimate? Are they big enough to support what it is that they want to do? So um, again, that's one of the reasons that we want to get involved early so that we know that your buyer is financially able to complete the transaction and get the payment to you. Yeah, credit, credit insurance is not going to cover somebody that, uh, you know, isn't going to qualify. Yeah, and you have to, I mean, most of our clients, they, they typically, like I say, one case, it was a big project, you know, first time with a, with a, with a so that, that was signed up for. Some of the others might have customers that they've developed over time. 
So that maybe they selected for two customers or three customers for a specific country. Very few have actually sort of wholesale sign up for it to cover every market they might be exporting to. So it's the good thing is that you can add it as you need it, you know, in markets. And then of course you have an ongoing relationship as well. So. Okay. Any other questions from the floor? I have one. Yeah, Doug. Um, so uh, one of the things we brought up uh, kind of at the beginning of this was um, how this can affect company valuation. And, um, and being so in some of the M&A processes with the company before, um, you know, there was a portion. One of the things that we look at when, when you're preparing a company for sale is the diversity of the customer base. So you don't want all your eggs in one basket. And, and so it's if you have 400 customers and lose a big customer, it's different than having 20 customers and losing a big customer. And we kind of looked at the exports that we were doing to Canada at the time as a single customer base in, in a foreign country, which um, we really couldn't count on as a predictable revenue stream. I mean, it was then, but when our buyers asked about it, it um, was something that we personally kind of discounted and say, you know, there, there's not enough. It, this is all our all of our eggs are in one basket for our, for our exports. So it, it, for us, it didn't, we didn't really consider it part of the valuation. Um, so I wondered if there's any um, exporters here or any um, idea about um, at what point do you have enough exports going on? And maybe it's relative to the company to where valuation is effective positively because it's just not a, you know, a one-time sale or a one customer that if it goes away, it's gonna be hard for you to then service the customer, um, the customer base they had developed, you know. I mean, uh, well, it's, it's a good question. It kind of makes me think too. Um, I, I think that it, it, if you have to look at it as a percentage of your total revenue, right? So let's say the company is $10 million in annual sales, and, but export is 1%. You know, in that case, it's it really, it's fairly insignificant, right? But um, early in my career, and you know, I worked for a company in Plymouth, um, and we reached a point in 1990 where export sales for the company is 55 percent. Privately held company, about 20 million dollars in revenue. That was a significant, you know. So that would need to be taken into evaluation. Now, it wasn't one single market; it wasn't one single customer. So we we didn't look at say Canada as as one customer, we really looked at, you know, we had, we had a big customer in Germany, for example, I think they're Europe at one point in time in about 92, 93 was six and a half million out of 20 million. And um, Europe itself and that customer was like 2 million. Yes, that's a significant risk. But at that case, if the company, it wasn't planned on selling it, but for evaluation purposes, you know, having 55% international was a huge, part of the of the business right um about 10 years ago i was in aerospace and we we, we did about 50 million dollars a year but it was a lot of projects so we could have a 10 million dollar project and then you know so the revenue went up and down quite a bit but at that stage probably 80 percent of new products were happening outside of the u.s because it was aerospace a lot of the u.s airlines were not maintaining or repairing fixing their own aircraft they sent them over to asia including china so we did almost all the products were overseas. So for that kind of client, I mean, it, it's a huge part of the evaluation. So it really gets down to, I would say it's once you hit something where export is a five or 10% of your revenue, it definitely takes into account. And, um, you know, the bigger the firm is, the, I think the more potential investor look at, you know, how, how ge geographically diversified are you in addition to industry and, size of the specific customers you have, for example. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of my, my thought on it, that you have to hit a certain percentage before it becomes significant, you know, in, in your evaluation of the company. Yeah, so be, yeah, so if you're, if you're gonna make a commitment to doing uh, international business, there, you probably have to have some idea of where it has to be before it really positively affects 
maybe the valuation. I, I don't yeah, know. I mean, that's kind of part of what I mentioned early on is that you, instead of just sort of taking an order here and there, or one of your US customers says, hey, I want you to ship something to my factory in Guangzhou, China. Um, so when you make a plan, you want to set a number of goals. Okay, who are we going to sell to? Which countries are best? You know, where's the most competition? And what's our plan? How much money are we going to put towards you know, achieving this thing? And what is the revenue goal? It's like, that's a good thing about sales is that it's black and white. You know, you have a goal, whether, you know, you, you know, so you know you hit it or you didn't hit it, right? So you can measure it fairly easily, right? And that's the same part of, just like putting any business plan together, you set goals, you, uh, you put resources towards it, you realize who needs to be involved in it. And that's how you, that's how you make it happen. Now, I would say that once you hit at least 10% or, or five to 10% of revenue, you should take it into account in your valuation. If it's less than that, yeah, not such a big deal. It's just like having a customer that, that I had a last company I worked corporate, we were $200 million in revenue. We, we sold to one of the big truck manufacturers, it was $55 million a year. Now, if we lost that one, it would just wipe out, probably have to lay off 150, 200 employees. So that, that I know exactly what the risk is that you have a few customers that are still dominating your business. So you'd rather have a hundred customers than just four. Um, I, and I would Thank add you. to that, that one thing that Dennis touched on is what's the reason for their doing the exports? You know, if they're an egg equipment manufacturer and um, you know, they've got their market here in, in North America um, and they're also selling to the Southern hemisphere, which is a different growing season, you know, that's a very important part. It could be a small dollar amount but it's good for their diversification and it keeps their uh, plant going year round as opposed to just seasonally. So there are things like that that also um, would add into, you know, your consideration of whether or not the exports have value for um, valuation purposes. Also from the product development standpoint, uh, if you've addressed a, your product to a new market, you may have improved it or you've needed to uh, gain more certifications of quality. Um, sometimes we found, for example, CE Mark uh, is understood in other markets, even though it, you're not selling necessarily just to Europe. So it, it may increase the value of your product. The other thing is that you, you may also develop the, the network and uh, working with a foreign client, you bring in their expertise into your business and, and that can work both ways. The licensing for potential, for example, they may produce a better product. Yeah. At yeah, least for their market. Yeah, like for example, this company, Pine River, Mark, remember the, 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 the operator manual that they, that they had it yeah. was basically the owner had put him together on a bunch of cocktail napkins in the favorite watering hole, about 12 pages worth. And there was red marks and different fonts, everything else. And we had to make a CE certified product and a manual end up being 45 pages in all kinds of detail that they are now using domestically because it's much better. So, you know, once again, it's, those are side benefits. Can you put a dollar figure on it? Not necessarily, but it's a lot of, you know, and all of the, these customers overseas, they ask, well, why don't you do this? Or could you add that to it? Uh, they want a hydraulic function of this one. Well, you know, I guess we could do it. So you get that, you get the different idea flowing as well from different parts of the world. So um, there's additional benefits. It's not just dollars and cents. Yeah. Well, in Thanks, respect of time. Yeah. Amy, do we have any uh, chat questions? Uh, no, there are not any right. At this Everybody's time. been in the middle of this, right at it. <laughs> That's good, though. This oh. is a great discussion. We we enjoy this, and we would welcome yeah. the opportunity to talk with any of any of the members about any of these topics. Sure. So, and I'd really like to thank the panel taking all their time to share the, all the experience they have. That's been really a big educational thing, I think, and. I really want to just thank everybody else that's still on with us. Some have had to drop off because we get run out of time, but uh, we'll hang on here a little bit along with the panel after we end the meeting. 
if you want to stay on to ask a question personally to all of them. And just want to, again, thank everybody. Uh, enjoy the remainder of your week. I do have one item I constantly push these days in all these stressful times. By tomorrow, figure out three things that you have gratitude for. Mm -hmm. There's got to be some good news in this world. Look for it, write it down. So with that,